On the show with me today, I have the honor of bringing on Marlene Robinson, event producer and personal development expert. She has been one of the few that has been planning events ever since she remembers her first event being when she was five years old. I can't wait to ask her all about that. And I also can't wait to hear about her story. After 20 years in the corporate America, Marlene left her career job and moved to Idaho where she plugged herself in the community by orchestrating retreats and events that grew into city-wide events for women with hundreds in the audience. Her passion took her to produce not just transformational events and eventually buy her own event center just as COVID shut everything down, but also to redefine herself again and again. Welcome to Events Demystified Podcast, where we explore and demystify the world of in-person, virtual, hybrid event AV production and technology by sharing insightful tips, tricks and tactics to make your events a success. This podcast is brought to you by Tree Fan Events, a woman-owned boutique event production agency. And your host is Anka Trafan, a technical event planner and producer with almost two decades of hands-on technical experience in event production. Welcome to another episode of Events Demystified Podcast, your one-stop shop for tangible, technical, and practical planning advice for anyone in the event industry. I am your host, Anka Trifan, and today's episode is brought to you by Trifan Events, a woman-owned boutique production agency. On the show with me today, I have the honor of bringing on Marlene Robinson, more about how she pivoted and how literally made lemon out of lemons that she was served during that challenging time. We'll have to ask her and we'll have to talk about it because this is so fascinating. And I will also have all the links that you can learn more about Marlene in the episode notes. But before we even get there, without further ado, let's bring Marlene in to have a conversation about all things producing outstanding events. Welcome to the show, Marlene. How are you doing today? I am great. I am so touched by your introduction. That was really, really sweet of you. Thank you very much for having me and for talking with me about all of this today. I'm super excited to have you here. You know what, Marlene, we've been following each other for a little while. And to be honest, I feel like the first time uh, you came on my radar was during one of the podcast interviews. I don't know if it was necessarily a podcast or a live stream that you were doing a couple of years back, right at the onset, I think, of the pandemic. I was listening to you and I was so fascinated by your level of knowledge of event production and events in general. And I was like, I can't believe she's local like I need to meet her <laughs> yeah I think I felt the same thing when I learned of you at first when we connected on social media I thought there's no way she's in Boise there's no way she's here locally she's you know so savvy and so smart and has all of this amazing technical experience she can't possibly be here and then I found out you were local and I thought wow I can't wait to meet you in person well I'm so happy that we finally got to actually we did get to meet in person for everyone wondering <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is virtually recorded. However, we got the opportunity to see each other. So to kick us off, Marlene, it's something that I like to break the ice with a question that I ask most of my featured guests. And uh, that is, what is something that you're super passionate about, aside from the things that basically I've already mentioned in the introduction, either personally or professionally? Super passionate about. Uh, it's it's hard to step out of you know personal and professional development because it is such a core component to who I am. But connection, connecting other people with one another, and I am so well networked in this community. Really, mostly because of all of the events that I've done. I've met so many amazing people. When I come across others, I think, wow, you need to know this person, or you need to meet that person, or you would have so much in common, or you'd be able to help each other's businesses. I'm all always looking for that opportunity to connect people together for their benefit because they either will make each other better or stronger or smarter or can help each other's business grow. 
And Marlene, that is a talent, a skill that not a lot of people have. And I can testify to that. You are one of the best connectors that I know. And uh, it's so amazing to see that there is the potential for that. And a lot of the event planners that I feel like locally I've met, they operate from the opposite part of the equation, from more of a scarcity mindset. And to have someone that like a like-minded a person that shares the same principles and the desire to connect other women and to make things happen together to me that's like you know music to my ears basically I wish I had a soundtrack right now to play so we can both you know jam on it but before we you know get to the dancing part how about I want to know who is Marlene the behind the doors Marlene and what brought her into event productions to begin with so most people wouldn't know I'm actually I'm actually more of an introvert than an extrovert. I definitely need my downtime. I need my space in my comfortable home environment. I meditate every single day. I pray and read every single day. It centers me. It keeps me focused on my mission and my purpose in life. I find that if I miss any of my days of meditation or reading, I can tend to get distracted or spin my wheels a little bit. So it's, it's a way I start my day. I've been doing it for almost three years now very consistently. And it keeps me focused on living in my passion and living in my purpose, which I believe is connecting, uniting and promoting people. I have always had a gift and desire to put people on stage and give them a microphone to share the gift that they were given with an audience that needs to hear it. And truly that has been the impetus for my, my wanting to do events. It wasn't because I wanted to put on an event and make money or sell tickets or entertain. It has always been very purpose driven in meeting amazing people who have a message that they need to share and gathering together the audience of people who need to hear that message, that transformational message. I've always had a motto when I talk about events or events that I'll get involved in, and that is I will only get involved in events that transform my audience intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, or physically. I even guaranteed my ticket sales. If you came to an event that I produced and you left unchanged, I would give you your money back. That's phenomenal. I love that we have the same practice, morning practice routine, because that's the same thing that I do to, you know, get myself centered and start my day right. And on the days when I just happen to be super long days of events or who knows what, and I miss that, I feel it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it definitely expresses itself in one way or another. And uh, one of the ways in which for me, it's something that I have to personally work hard on is the level of anxiety that it's under mm -hmm. control or not based on, you know, how much quiet time I had in the morning. If we lose sight of the fact that we can't solve every problem with our own minds and we we are in a, a stressful environment and we didn't get centered in the morning, we can all of a sudden start thinking, well, I have to come up with all the solutions. I have to solve all the problems. And we forget that it's our alignment with our creator and our spirit inside that really helps solve any problem that we come across. So when we lose our focus, it usually is because we're thinking we have to solve everything. And it's always on our shoulders. So I, yeah, I, you know what that feels like. So piggybacking on the question, earlier question, I have this other question for you. How does a woman in event production advance and create a clear path for herself when there's a lot of obstacles that she must overcome? And just a little bit from your story, I would love to hear how you got where you are right now, knowing that, I mean, at the onset of the pandemic, you basically invested yourself into a venue that that shut down the moment you purchase it. Pretty darn close. I, I had been in business for I, almost half a year and maybe seven months. And I was just beginning to turn a profit. I invested in it. I renovated it. I refurbished it. I, oh, I promoted it. And I was just sustaining myself on my savings. And I was just starting to turn a profit. My overhead was, you know, pretty significant there. And then, oh, and then the pandemic hit and, and shut me down. So yeah, it was pretty devastating and difficult to get 
over. But to go to the beginning part of your question of um, how did I make my path into this industry? It's pretty unorthodox. I personally love unorthodox stories. So I'm going to get my coffee and let's go. <laughs> All right. I feel like the path that you were on was much harder than the one that I was on. I have been very committed to women's development, uh, so much so that I was the women's ministry leader at my church. I was leading Bible studies just for women. Um, I joined networking groups that were just for women. I truly isolated myself from co-ed networking, probably because of my experience in corporate America being very oppressive and uh, manipulative and controlling. I stepped away from that male-dominated world intentionally. And I started focusing on women only events. And that was really my path forward. That was my niche. I started creating experiences for women that they found great value in. They knew that if I was going to put on an event, I was going to have high quality speakers. I was going to have high quality music. I was going to make them feel special and welcome. That's also a very, very important thing to me that when you walk in the doors to an event that I produce, that you feel a part of that community immediately. And I want to try to create that level of engagement from the moment someone steps into um, an event that I produce. So I just started doing it for my church. And then I, on my own, rented out the botanical gardens because I had these three amazing speakers who just were life-changing and had incredible messages of motivation and inspiration and hope. And then I found a killer band and I brought in a coffee cart and a wine and beer uh, vendor and I brought in a food truck and it just was this incredible experience that started giving me this reputation for putting on these transformational events that were fun and engaging and value added. But it was at my own expense. So that was part of the difference is I wasn't being hired to do this. I was inspired to do this. And one of the most pivotal moments for me where I knew for sure that I had found my calling was at an, the event that I did at the Botanical Gardens. It was about two minutes before I was going to go on stage and introduce the band and the keynote speakers. And I looked out over the lawn. It was a beautiful summer evening and there were about 250 women there and they were talking talking and chatting and sharing food and wine and laughing. And I saw community being created. I saw connection happening at this very deep and meaningful level. And I felt so much peace and joy in that moment. And I realized this should probably be a moment where I'm a little stressed out or worried, like I'm about to go on stage and introduce this whole thing and kick it off and make it happen. But there wasn't an ounce of stress or worry or fear. And I had this profound feeling that came over me that was, this is what I was called to do. This is what I was put on this planet to do, was to put people on stage to share a message and gather the audience that needs to hear it and create a very special life-changing experience for everyone. And it snowballed from there. And I rented out Boise Center on the Grove and I had an event for 500 women and I had five keynote speakers and a band and 48 female business owners and breakouts for yoga and meditation and healing. And then people started hiring me. So I created my own brand, I guess, by living into what it is I felt the world needed. And then people identified that as, yeah, I want to do that too. I have a message also. Can I hire you? So then they started hiring me to do their large scale events that would last three and four days and would have 15 different keynote speakers throughout the entire thing with VIP access and 38 volunteers and orchestrating the whole thing and the market marketing campaign for it and the development of the messaging and coaching the speakers up onto the stage to share their message. It just flowed naturally from me because I was living into this thing that was my calling and my purpose. And it just grew to the point where there were so many events 
to be put on and so many great experiences that people needed to have that I had to rent out venue spaces that were expensive. And as you know, when your overhead costs are high, your ticket price is high. And because it's so important to me that people have access to valuable information and life transforming events, I decided the best way to get around that would be to buy my own event center, lower my ticket prices, create an opportunity for everybody to have access to these things for 10 or $15 each and put incredible speakers and authors and coaches on stage to share their message. And it was happening. It was rolling and it was so exciting. And people could rent out the event center for weddings and parties also, but I just wouldn't even get involved with that. They just hand them the keys and teach them how to use the space. But then COVID. So I had to shift and really go inside myself to figure out what am I going to do with my life because I felt this was my calling and my purpose. Mm -hmm. And the message I received, the divine calling and inspiration I received was I've been spending so much time putting a microphone in front of other people's mouths and giving them a stage to share their message. It's time for me to share what it is I've learned and what I know inside of an environment that I'm very familiar with. And that is corporate America. I had an experience that was not great. I was in a career that did not serve my purpose and my values and my gifting. And I want to help others find their value and their gifting and their calling and be able to live into that. So I took everything I've learned, everything I've experienced in all of these transformational events. I read over 240 personal development and professional development books in the last four years. I've gotten myself certified in behavioral analysis assessments. And now I go into businesses and I help transform lives in corporate America. I love, I mean, this is a transformational story right here and there. I was getting goosebumps just as you were talking about it, because the reality is not a lot of people, women and men ever get the opportunity to feel what it's like to, as you mentioned, live in their calling and do the things that they are meant to do and not just, you know, be on a payroll somewhere and feel like their life is wasted away. So here's one question, because you mentioned just a little bit on your journey, you know, in the corporate America, what do you feel like has been one of the hardest obstacles or limitations to overcome on this journey of rediscovering yourself post-corporate America? That's a really good question. And it's a tough question. I was an expert at what I did. And I was very, very good. I was very well paid at the work that I did in corporate America. I was a what's called a category analyst. I dealt with analytics of consumer behavior. And I created stories utilizing data and analysis to help manufacturers of consumer goods understand how to sell more of their consumer goods to the people who wanted to buy them. And when I left that, I was no longer an expert expert at anything. I no longer had a highly valued skill. I didn't have a secure paycheck or health insurance or retirement or 401k that comes with the security of a corporate job. So that was a big hurdle I had to overcome. It being okay that I wasn't an expert at something and that I couldn't command $150,000 a year with bonuses and 401k options. I had to reevaluate my value. And in the beginning, it was very hard because I felt like I don't have a lot of experience. I don't have this expertise. I'm not well known for what I do yet. So I did not value myself the way I should have in the beginning. And it took me quite some time to be comfortable with charging for my services and being very clear on my contractual obligations with my client and not letting myself get overextended or taken advantage of. That was a learning curve, a big learning curve that I know you're familiar with. Before we move any further, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our main sponsor, Trifan Events, which is a boutique event planning and production agency that will come alongside you, offering personalized event planning and technical support, strategic event design, production and technology management, and flawless execution for live, virtual, and hybrid events. The team at Trifan Events is passionate about planning and producing event experiences that get people involved with true moments of interaction, engagement, and co-creation 
while offering white glove treatment throughout the entire planning process, enabling you to reach your event goals with the use of creativity, production tools, and event technology. And on how Trifun Events can plan and produce your event become memorable, go to trifunevents.com. I feel like a lot of women that probably are listening right now can identify with that because in so many ways, each one of us have had to stand for ourselves in those ways, set our own boundaries and struggle basically through the same things, uh, regardless of the industry or the position or whatever career of choice we're in. Yeah. Definitely. And I think it's a, you know, it's a cultural thing too. For some reason, you know, women don't get paid as much as men, even if we have the same education and the same skill set. There's this thing in our world that says we can't make as much money as men. And we get that in our heads because if society says it's true, well, then we must believe that it's true. So then we undervalue what it is we have to offer. And I think that's a block that we have to get over and we have to demand that we deserve just as much as anyone else in our field or our industry. And now that you and I both have this experience and this expertise, we can name our price and be very confident in what it is we deliver when we name our price. And I think the same things can extend to many other things, like having a voice in a room, in a boardroom, like you mentioned, or demanding a certain level of respect based on the expertise and the knowledge and the experience that you bring to the table. And in the field that I'm in, that's just as much male dominated as, you know, the one that you were in, in corporate America. I feel like many times women don't necessarily feel like they can even open their mouth to say what they mean and what they want or what the job requires and that is not working in their advantage but even when you do open your mouth that doesn't always work in your advantage i've had a situation happen just recently where i have had to say here are the things that are required for you to be part of this particular event and i had a lot of backlash attitude and behavioral like aggressiveness shown just because i required it as part of the job which was already part of the contract and i was like like, this is surprising. If any other person in my position that would have been, you know, of a different gender would have asked you the same thing, you have not even bad a lash. But here we are, like having this conversation, like it's some sort of like unheard ask that you've never had to deal with before. And it felt disrespectful in the sense that I can come into a room and I can have a set of expectations. And that could be the same set of expectation that any other person in my position has. But but if I'm the female, I have more resistance that is, you know, perceived as where you're too demanding or who knows, like whatever, put a label on the things that you've had to fight for maybe in your career, in your life. And you know that there's always going to be a bit of resistance. And that's where I'm always thinking if we could be on the same plane and this cultural expectation would not be over our heads so much anymore, how much more could we accomplish in a lifetime? Right? You know, and I have to say this leads just perfectly into the work I do now. Because what I do with behavioral profiling is I remove that personal bias, that judgment. So it isn't so much what I've discovered now, what I but I used to believe it was a gender issue. It's a dominance issue. It's a non-personal dominance issue. That individual who responded to you in an inappropriate, disrespectful, condescending way has a behavioral profile that is triggered by yours. So when we can do the, the scientific analysis to understand how you are defined, your behavioral profile and the behavioral profile of others that you work with or interact with, we can give you tools and specific words to use that diffuse any sort of conflict or lack of connection in a business environment, a business relationship or personal relationship. It literally removes all the personal 
personal bias and judgment. It's no longer personal. Um, when somebody treats you with disrespect, it's because they have a problem, not you. And you're able to really understand. I literally have like a sheet that shows you <laughs> how to communicate with each of the personality styles. We need to post this somewhere, Marlene. I know. You have to give me the resource so I can put it somewhere because I'm sure there's many other women in a male-dominated world where they feel like they don't always have the allies to support them in their mission and their careers and whatever projects they're working in. Yeah, it definitely because we are taught as women to be more submissive, to be less commanding and less demanding, to have a quieter tone of voice. And when we show up in our full power, men are put off and they don't understand how to interact with it, especially if they're older men, because they're not part of our new generation of women having all of the same power and authority that men have. So we do have to have like a little grace and give them permission to like come along and catch up with the times. But when we can use words and language that diffuse their initial resistance to our power and authority, it helps us connect better and lead better. We can lead anyone if we know how it is they need to be communicated with. And this is the work that I do. I get I love that every day. I love it. So how do you feel now that you've gone through this entire journey and post COVID? How do you feel that you are positioned after months of persevering basically and being so resilient to find a new revenue stream for yourself because obviously that was you know a big part of having to support yourself and a journey of rediscovery of what are other things that you're passionate about because events were not happening how do you feel you are positioned now to take advantage of this new and disrupted in a way meetings events landscape that we're basically facing right now I love that question. Thank you. It's it's a very interesting evolution that I've gone through. And I feel like everything I've been through, everything I've done has prepared me for this moment in time. It's all like this building and learning. And I'm reaching this almost pinnacle of I feel so capable and qualified to go and do the work I do. So while I'm not doing large scale events, but what I'm doing now is more intimate. It's in smaller groups. I'm doing it inside of the corporate environment. I'm doing it with teams and with individuals even. And I'm working with coaches who are bringing me into their clients to help them accelerate their work. So to a degree, I am still doing events. I'm doing workshops. I'm doing all kinds of workshops and seminars and public speaking with smaller groups. And I'm not the one producing it. I'm the one being invited in to teach and train. So it's the other side of the microphone that I get to be on now, which is really exciting because I feel like I know how to create an incredible experience for the audience and really add value to what it is they're going to take away from the day um, spent with me or hours spent with me. I love that. Now on that piggybacking on your, on the workshops that you've been doing, I know that you've also created the expert's guide to producing outstanding events, which is an online training curriculum to help people do events better. And this has also morphed into Boise business broadcasting. Can you tell us more about that? And as a teaser, maybe share a couple of tips or suggestions for producing outstanding events. Yes. Yes. So I, I wrote the expert's guide to producing outstanding events at the beginning of 2020. And it was because I was transferring into you know running my own event center. So I couldn't be hired to do big, large scale events. But I knew that people needed the information. They needed the expertise and the understanding on how to do it. So I thought I'm going to create a training course. I invested 90 hours of my life. There are probably, I don't know, three hours worth of video trainings, downloadable worksheets and tools, timeline developer, marketing programs, how to train your team, how to build your message how to rehearse, how to execute AV. But now I should rewrite that after I learn more from you. But I, when all I, the virtual events and virtual technology right. and all the hybrid production that now we're dealing with, right? <laughs> yeah, so that'd be like a whole nother level of information to add into it. But one thing I learned was, and you probably know this too, when you tell people what it takes, 
to put on a really great large scale event, they kind of start to just gloss over and like get nervous and say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I don't want to do I'm just going to hire you to do it. So many people are intimidated by what it takes to really put on an excellent event. But the curriculum I created can teach anyone, someone inside of corporate America who has to do like a national sales meeting or a brand launch, or somebody who works at a real estate firm and wants to put on a really great training seminar or summit or symposium. They can all use this knowledge and get it done well. And it's in digestible pieces. It's a three-part curriculum. You can do it at your own pace. And it really does break it down into very bite-sized pieces. And I give you every single spreadsheet and tool you need in order to do it well. So that's available. But because I hadn't gotten much traction because nobody was doing events and nobody wanted to know how to put on events, I morphed that into Boise Business Broadcasting, which is really an opportunity for for people who've wanted to do a TED Talk. If you ask a room full of people, hey, has anybody here ever wanted to do a TED Talk? More than half the people raise their hand. They have a message to share. And that's part of my mission is creating an opportunity for people to share their message. So what I've done is I've rented out the lounge at the end of the universe every third Wednesday of the month for the remainder of the year. And anybody who wants to master their TED Talk can go through our program. I work with a TEDx certified coach and we will get you trained in a cohort environment and give you the opportunity to create and develop your TEDx talk. And then we will put you on stage in front of a live audience. We will live stream it to your Facebook page, record it and bank that content for you to use however you want. So it's an opportunity that's an extension of the expert's guide to producing outstanding events. That's just a more tangible real life experience and opportunity to get you on stage and get that content for your website, your Facebook page, your coaching program, whatever that is. I love that. A couple of years ago, maybe it was three years ago, I actually had pitched an idea for the TEDx, local TEDx here in Boise. And it was a fantastic pitch and a fantastic idea, but unfortunately did not meet, you know, the criteria for the topic of the year that year. Yeah. But it was so much fun. I was actually excited just to be part of the experience because I'm all for experiences, even if it takes me like totally out of my comfort zone. And that was one of those. <laughs> That is so cool. Yeah, we're working with one of those coaches. Her name is Kirsten Holmberg. Yep. And I was uh, following her tips and guidelines as well. So I'm glad that you have her because she's amazing what she does. And maybe I'll come up with another idea soon. Who knows? (laughs) Great. Well, and we're not going to do like a set criteria the way TEDx does, just because this is going to be more free form. So maybe you go back to that original pitch that you had a few years ago and get that recorded and use that. Okay, Marlene, this was a fantastic conversation so far. Thank you for sharing so much of your learned wisdom. I have a last topic that I want to touch on just a little bit here and maybe a last piece of advice or anything that you like to share for any other event professionals, event planners, producers out there that are attempting to make a comeback and need a little bit of event strategy or life coaching strategy to how to do that well. Um, Okay, so... We're still living in a time where there are people who are somewhat concerned about gathering in large numbers. And if you can get yourself plugged into an organization or a group of individuals that isn't going to have a lot of restrictions and regulation on that gathering, it's going to make your job a little bit easier. But the basics, having hand sanitizer available, options of masks for people who feel more comfortable, having appropriate spacing and seating and all of that, and and helping people understand that they do have options and that they, they will be respected if they want to keep their distance. That's one thing that I just really want to say. It is still important to a lot of people that we do that and we keep that top of mind. But I would say I've got two main pieces of advice that I have always given to every client. And some of us already know it. Some of us, you know, it's obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway, because to some people it's not. Number one is you start with the end in mind. What is your expected outcome? What do you want to get from the event that you're going to put on? Do you want people to buy something? Do you want people to join something? Do you want people to simply walk away with information and tools to help their business grow? Whatever that is, that end result you are looking for, define it very, very clearly and build your plan backwards. Because if you work all of your details 
to meet your end goal, you're going to be more successful and effective in producing a really valuable um, and cohesive event. So know the end, Have the start with the end in mind. What do you want your guests saying and thinking when they leave? What are they going to go home and tell their family about what it was they just experienced? So that's number one. Number two is no solo gigs. And that means although you might have an incredible message to share and you're brilliant and experienced and wise beyond all measure, when you do a solo performance, presentation, speech, keynote, and there are no other speakers on that stage, your odds of impacting every single person in that room are reduced compared to if you had at least one other person on that stage. The reason being, not everyone in the room is going to connect with you. Not everyone in the room is going to relate to your story or respect your perspective. But if you bring up a industry expert or a subject matter expert that has a complimentary message to share about whatever it is you're teaching on or you're speaking about, your odds of impacting that audience multiplied because now those individuals have an opportunity to connect with either one of you or maybe both of you. But if it's just you, your odds are you're not going to connect with everybody in that room. So no solo gigs and bring in subject matter experts. Be willing to share the stage. Have an abundance mindset. You didn't get where you are on your journey alone without leaders and mentors and coaches and uh, authors, right? Share what those resources were. If you even just put a podcast up on the screen or your favorite TEDx or a local author's book, share who helped you become the person you are today so that your audience understands that they have other resources available just like you did. And when you share that stage, it gives you more credibility in their eyes anyway, because you have a generous growth mindset to share that stage with a subject matter expert. Thank you for sharing your wisdom on that. I think that's fantastic. And especially anyone that is in a position to be a presenter, keynote, a moderator of any type, sort of form in any situation, they could take that tip and implement it. Love that. Where can our audience connect with you, Marlene, if they want to learn more about? And I'll testify to this. Marlene has some amazing LinkedIn posts. If you're on LinkedIn, you must follow her. So where else can they connect with you? Thank you. Uh, yes. So social media, um, just Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm not really present on Instagram. My website, um, migenterprises.com. That's M-I-I-G, just like in the logo below my name. Also, uh, Black River Performance Management. So that's where I am a partner and it's dub www.blackriverpm.com. And so I'm a consultant, trainer, and coach and partner there at that firm. And that's where I'm doing the majority of my keynotes and workshops and training. But you can always find me at Mig Enterprises. And that'll be a forever thing I'm plugged into. I love it. Okay, friends, this is it for today's episode. I'm so happy that we got to do this, Marlene. Thank you so much for everyone that's been listening so far. Make sure you check out the episode notes because we got a special gift from Marlene. 10 tips for producing outstanding events that you can download and implement just as we speak. And stay tuned for our next episode airing out soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Events Demystified podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to review it, rate it, and share it with other event professionals that could benefit from it. Connect with us on social at Events Demystified Podcast. We would love to hear from you and what you're up to. If you'd like to learn more about Tree Fan Event Services and find out if we're a good fit in supporting your event, can we help your event be successful with a 20-minute free consultation? Link in the episode's notes. Thanks for tuning in.